Ladies and gentlemen, happy Friday. We are back. My name is Clark Sell. Welcome to another edition of Ask That. And uh, today, today we're going to talk about learning, teaching, all that is good with education. As you can see behind me, I obviously um, am a book whore. Um, I have another stack on the other side of this. Uh, I can guarantee that I have read every single one of those books. Um, and with that today, I have Erica Langerand. Did I get it right? All right. Otherwise known as Erica Carlson, for those who have been paying attention for the entirety of the internet. Um, so, Erica, before we get started about uh, about this journey... Uh, can mm -hmm. you give everybody a quick intro on who you are? Yeah, okay. So I am Erica Lingerand. Um, I am the Director of Training and Development at a magical little software company called Detroit Labs in Detroit, Michigan. Um, I've been with Detroit Labs for about five years. I started as an iOS developer five years ago. Before that, I was a back-end Java developer. Before that, I did websites for nonprofits. Um, so I came in as a dev, and that's my background, and that's the thing that I love. Um, but I had the opportunity when I was about a year and a half into my career at Detroit Labs to run a um, program that turned into our developer apprenticeship program. We brought in people who had no prior software experience, and over the course of three months, we trained them to be developers and then hired them. Um, so now our team is about 30% engineers who were trained through our own internal apprenticeship program. Um, and after the first one, I was asked if I wanted it to be my full-time job, so now it is. Uh, and then in the last year or so, that's actually evolved into doing training development for the entire organization. That is uh, that is a whirlwind of stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and I I uh, appreciate the uh, the heritage there as I used to work for a company called Telerik. I worked mm -hmm. there for a few years, and we had something called the Telerik Academy, um, mm -hmm. which was very much the same like teach teach people, put them through I don't want to say boot camp, but you know put them through some training, and um, sure. some got hired on, and some went out to go do other stuff, and it was a it was a cool thing uh, that still exists today in uh, mm -hmm. in Bulgaria. So. Um, very cool. What got you to the teaching side of things? Uh, I mean, I, being a developer, I think we are, um, we are certainly forced to learn, uh, mm -hmm. or continue, continual learning. Uh, mm -hmm. so what, what got you to then teaching? Sure. So, um, it's actually kind of that it goes back to my, my own personal path into software development. Um, so I actually studied psychology in college. Before that, I was a musician. Um, I played the violin and viola for 20 some years. Um, had an injury and had to kind of redirect my career path away from music. And so became a psych major because I thought people were interesting. Um, that's, you know, your decisions at 21, right? Um, uh, I, I started as, Hey, I think I'm going to be an accountant. And I ended up with, I don't like any of this. And I don't know, <laughs> let's just see what I can still get so I can get out. Well, I did, I did actually love psychology and do love psychology. Um, but I then graduated with an undergrad degree in psychology, which you're either unemployed or in grad school at that point. Um, and I was starting to kind of play around with grad classes and thinking that I wanted to be a therapist. And, um, I was working in mediation. Um, the primary, uh, people that we were mediating for people who were getting divorced. And uh, that was about as much fun as it sounds. Um, and I noticed that I was, <laughs> I noticed that I was coming home every day, really just like sad you know, down and like, yeah, yeah, sad. And, 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 um, you know, it's, it's hard when you're you know, in your early twenties, like you're not really ready to, to coach people through the hardest days of their lives. I don't think, yeah. or at least I wasn't. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know that you could ever be like, I could never, I can, I, I, I sympathize with like ER physicians, doctors, whatever the right term is, who are sitting there and, you know, maybe on a daily basis, see somebody die. And I, I just, you know, I could never live with that. They are much better people than, than I am. Yeah, well, I mean, I feel much more equipped to deal with, with people's challenges 10 years in. Um, but at the time, I was just, I was overwhelmed. Yeah. And so I was kind of flailing around trying to figure out what I wanted to do and what I could do and um, happened to take a programming course on MIT's OpenCourseWare. They had their intro yeah, to yeah. Yeah. Yep. How do you happen to do something like that? Like you don't just have. It's not like you're you just showed up at a restaurant and just happen to have the scallops because they were on special and they like you don't just end up over on MIT and say I want this. I'm bad. Ah, looks cool. Let's try it. 
Well, I knew a lot of people who were developers. So I had a couple of friends in the tech industry who were who were talked about it all the time. Um, and I also, so I was homeschooled until I was in ninth grade. And so I was really used to just like picking things up and trying things out and going, sure. oh, how about this? How about that? Okay. So I was sort of like, I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to explore it. This okay. was like right before the like Code Academy and Udemy yeah, and yeah, all yeah, that yeah, yeah. stuff popped up. Yep. Like it was just, I think I was actually a beta tester for Code Academy early on. Okay. Um, and so, so the online learn to code movement was like just getting started. And so it was good timing for me. Um, but the MIT course was fantastic. I learned Python. I absolutely loved it. I remember like my first little hello world popped up and I was like, I could run the universe. <laughs> That's it. This is so cool. It's funny um, you say that. I, I can remember kind of my first like real foray, at least in the school in the programming. And I was sitting next to a kid. Uh, and it was a Pascal class, and we had to do a thing. And I just, I hadn't had those moments yet with software. And this kid next to me, he's got, it shit's dancing on the screen, and it's doing, and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm screwed. Like, there's no <laughs> way I'm going to be able to get through this. Yeah, so I actually, like, I loved it. I was kind of a little bit of a nerd in high school, um, so that probably helped. Um, it just, it made a lot of sense to me. Like, programming intuitively, I just enjoyed it. I loved sure. it. I was, I was not terrible at it. Um and so I took a C programming class at my local community college, fun way to, yeah. to get yeah. into there, um, but loved that as well. Had a fantastic instructor who really inspired me, and she was up teaching, and I was like, I want to be you someday. Um, so that was kind of my first, like, she inspired me so much, and I thought, you know, I would love to do that for somebody else at some point. So then I get into the field, um, and I was self-taught, so I had no idea how you go about getting a job when you're self-taught. Sure. And and so I just happened to link up with a girl on a Facebook group that was called like women in tech in Detroit or something like that. Um, and she wanted to bring a chapter of girl develop it to Detroit. Okay. And this was 2012. So this was still pretty early and MGD. I now has like, you know, dozens of chapters and thousands of members. Yep. Um, this was still pretty early for girl develop it. Um, and so the two of us started a chapter together in Detroit and at, the launch party for that we had about 100 people show up which was blew our minds fantastic yeah yeah right um and i at this point i was already like so gdi's mission is to teach women software development and so yeah. again the teaching thing kind of popped up um and at that launch party i met the recruiter from pillar technology in ann arbor which yeah. is where i got my first job in the industry okay um yeah so that was that <laughs> and before that i had been working for like kind of you know, the, on a contract basis for a couple of nonprofits doing some websites. And so I had gotten a little bit of like, a little bit of delivery. Yeah, had a taste. Not much. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I went into Pillar basically as an apprentice um, and they taught me everything that I knew. Um, and they knew that, you know, kind of going in and we're like, sure. we're going to invest in you. We're going to, we think you're potential. potential. Um, and I spent the next year just, you know, learning my face off <laughs> and being taught by really wonderful, smart, kind, compassionate people. Um, who were so patient with me and just were so willing to spend hours even outside of work, you know, helping me learn this stuff. Um, so I had great teachers. So that was how it and so, And that's what I want to dig into. Like that's uh, what, what does, what does that look like? You know, what does, you know, learn one's face off or one <laughs> who's sat there and, and really taught well or seeks to be taught well, like, like where, where, where do we start with that? Um, so the best tool for me as a junior developer, honestly, was pair programming. Um, the shop that I worked at, it was it was all pairing all the time, and so you you were never really working solo, which was for me was great as a junior developer. Um, yeah. As an introvert, it was challenging, but uh, I had great partners, so that was good. Um, but so but I, in that so but in that scenario, right? Knowing that that's the case, how can you and knowing that you have a degree in psychology, like <laughs> let's dig in a little bit here. So then how? How can one who either wants to teach or be taught like exist in that world where it is uncomfortable or maybe has, has done any pair programming? Um, you look for people who are good to pair with and good teachers. And I was really lucky that I just stumbled into this company that was full of those people. Sure. Um, so I think finding a company that has a good teaching and learning culture, which Pillar certainly did, um, that was a big differentiator for me. And the people that I sat with had sat with dozens of junior developers, you know, yeah. and so they kind of knew how to, how to do this and how to help me. Um, you know, I, I paired with this one guy for you know eight or nine months straight. Um, he taught me pretty much everything I know. And he was so patient. Like this guy had been doing back in Java for 12 years. Um, and, and I would have the simplest question and he'd go, yeah, huh? I don't know. What do you think? 
I'm like, I know you know. You know you know. <laughs> this is so obviously a teaching exercise for me right now. Um, and I'd roll my eyes, but then I would, like, kind of noodle on it, and I would get there. And I think that was the biggest piece was, like, being able to work with somebody who was patient enough to let me kind of work through the process sure, and figure yeah. things out. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, don't and just give the answer. Right. Yeah. And yeah. then like direct when I got really stuck, but being able to recognize that. Um, I think that like what I took from that is mentoring, parent teaching are, are huge investments for a developer. And so if you've got a senior dev who's also full time coaching a junior, like it's a thing you have to be aware of in terms of their workload. So does it just have to be senior, junior? Can can we like take the take the levels out of it? Doesn't this apply to yeah. everybody at all times? Oh, yeah, all the time. I think you learn. I mean, I now I mostly pair with brand new developers and I learn every single time that I do that. And, you know, we get in 10 minutes and it's like, I don't know how that happened. Let's yeah. start, start to figure it out together. Right. So pairing, I think, is always a mutual learning process. Yeah. I mean, I bring that up because I, you know, knowing the answer to that question, obviously, <laughs> um, I feel like it's an important thing. Like, I feel like I'm learning every day. And if I don't. Yeah. Um, for me, you know, even, even just this conversation here, you know, mm -hmm. I will, I will learn something which feels greedy at times, but I hope others <laughs> do as well. Um, sure. but yeah, I, and, and I think I remember early in my career, it was always, it's, it's always easy to see somebody get super defensive when, um, when you've put a lot of time into something and either you've gone down the wrong road or the right road, or there's a different mm -hmm. way to change, you have to be open to not necessarily criticism, but outside perspectives on why things should work a certain way. Code reviews can be super daunting at times, but yet they're super necessary. So if you really embrace the, the thing around it, um, they can be either fantastic or like terrible. Um, yeah, I, I was very fortunate in that I was always coached that, you know, we're all here to learn everybody, no matter how long you've been doing this. And then also like you are not your code, right? So you may have written a terrible solution to something. It does not mean you are a terrible person or even a terrible developer. You just wrote a bad solution. Right. Yeah, so like yeah. that was, that was what was kind of instilled in me and what I try to instill as a teacher. Yeah, totally. You are not your code. That is for sure. And it would be different tomorrow, you know, yes. so it's so contextual point in time of the things around right. you and, time to get stuff done so so then let's deep dive into learning some like what are you know you mentioned pairing but you know as somebody who maybe doesn't have those resources whatnot how how do you distill down the epic amount of stuff that comes across the desk every day uh first you accept that you will never be on top of things i think that was the biggest lesson for me and still a lesson that i kind of relearn in a yeah. routine basis um it's the one that's the biggest thing that I teach new developers is like, you're never going to feel like you have mastered this. So just accept that and always kind of be in that beginner's mind kind of place. And you will be so much happier. Um, after that, it's having a good understanding of how you personally learn. And so, you know, again, like being homeschooled and kind of having done self-directed learning for a lot of my life, I already kind of knew that. I know that I am a book person. And if I read a thing, I know the thing. Um, a lot of people cannot read programming books and then feel like they learned something. Yeah. Like it's got to yeah. be, I have to have my hands on or somebody has to sit next to me and talk me through it or somebody's got to show me a, a diagram, right? Yeah. Um, I'll never forget this. I had this moment about learning styles when I was teaching uh, my first apprenticeship class for Detroit Labs. And I was talking about pass by reference versus pass by value. <laughs> And I thought that I had actually put a pretty cogent explanation together. And one of my students is just looking at me and she's like, so completely like, just obviously it's not, it's not clicking. Yeah. Um, and as I'm in my head, like, okay, how do I, how do I do this better? She goes, can you explain it with otters? Otters? Yes. Like, like the animal. Or it involved tiny cute animals. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I did, which unfortunately I've forgotten it, but it, it did get the point across. Um, but yeah, it, I was just sitting here thinking, how, how would you explain it? <laughs> I, I really don't. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I don't remember, but I came up with something and, and, you know, she walked away understanding. So. Wow. <laughs> um, but that was such a moment for, for going, Oh, like how people learn, you know, that's, uh, that's a key thing. And so to learn and to learn rapidly as you have to, as a developer, you have to know kind of, of what you do. Um, so for me, it's, it's books. I do a lot of like tutorials. If I, I wanted to learn Kotlin like six months ago. And so I, you know, kind of harassed all my developers who know Kotlin and said, Hey, what are your favorite resources? What do you like? Um, compiled all those. And then, you know, went through them and picked stuff that worked for me. Um, but I'm somebody who like, if I'm in a book or in a video tutorial or whatever, and it's like, 
and I'm, I'm wandering off, like that's probably not the right thing for me. And I'll just move on to the mm. next thing. Cause there's so many resources out there, like being able to quickly go, this is going to work for me. This is not, I think is an important piece too. Yeah. I, I am somebody who is needs to do um, mm-hmm. like if there is no real world um, application to it, it means mm-hmm. nothing to me. Like I can't comprehend it. I actually, um, I, I have to visually see everything in my head. Um, uh-huh. And, and I could see pathways and all that. And once I understand how something works, like I, I just, I it just all is graphed in my head and books for me are pretty much a reference utility. You know, if I get stuck, yeah. I kind of dive into the book, but I have to do, right? there's yeah. no, there's no, there's no other. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, I was always really willing to just kind of take abstractions on faith. Like somebody said, okay, this is a for loop. And I said, okay, it's a for loop. I don't know what I would do with that, but okay, cool. I, I believe that. Yeah. Um, most of my students do not feel that way. It's like, this is an if statement. And they're like, okay, why do I care? And so actually now all of my lecture slides have sort of like, here's the thing. Here's how you do the thing. Here's why the thing actually matters yeah. in the context. There's something you're going to build. Yeah. All right. So, so kind of go in the other direction then you, I mean, you were just touching on teaching. How, how can we teach better? How can we mm-hmm. teach mo- more better? um well first i think that i think everybody should learn to teach in some way because i think of knowledge as kind of having levels of you know you understand a thing okay i know that a for loop is a thing you can apply a thing i i can write one and, and make it work in context and then you can teach a thing which is i can do the thing and then i can get somebody else through understanding and applying um i think that Teaching made me a much better developer and oh, yeah. and oh, yeah. made me dig under the hood and made me learn things on a level that I just wouldn't have yep. even thought to care about. So that's my little pitch for teaching. Um, I, I totally agree. I, I yeah. mean, I without without question, it's one thing to say it. It's one thing to read it. It's one thing to do it. It's a whole nother thing to then try to teach, try to take that and, and scale it. It's, yeah. it's super hard. And, nothing forces you to understand a topic more deeply than the terrifying realization that you will have to explain it to a group of people yeah. who will then ask you questions that you may not be able to answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, but, but how to be a good teacher, right? Um, I think the biggest component of that is feedback. It's seeking feedback and, and in real time, which is the hard part, you know, and being able to make adjustments right away kind of on the fly. Um, you know, I have ways that I like to explain concepts, but if I'm in front of a room and I see people like, you know, if I'm losing them, if they're like on their phones or they look bored or they look lost and confused, I've got to stop, cycle back and really fast, like figure out how to pick them up again. Um, so that I think is, is the biggest piece is being okay. able to kind of read the people in front of you and then respond to them. Okay. So how are you reading people? Like, what does that look like? Um, I look for a lot of body language because really most of our communication is body language. Um, if somebody's leaning forward and they're nodding and they're and all the normal visual cues that somebody's engaged with you, right? Like that's a good sign for me. Um, I, if people are kind of on their laptops and they're not like constantly looking up and checking in, if they're just like buried, yeah. then I'm worried that I'm losing them on their phones, definitely losing them looking yeah. around, staring out the window, like usually losing them. Um, and then it, sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's subtle. I look for kind of signs of anxiety in people's faces, right? Like I've gotten to the point now where I spend so much time teaching that like I can pick out the three people in the room who are totally lost and don't want to raise their hand. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, and a lot of that is just, is practice, right? Like, and is, yeah. is learning to kind of note how people respond. Yeah. Do you think that there's a good like routine of it is, you know, is an hour a day a good thing is a, is a focused eight hours on a weekend a good thing? I mean, I I know, I know we started with, you know, you should really learn oneself, but let's say one does not know. Are there, are there better, are there, I don't know, better goo Um, around that? Yeah, no. So I, um, so our program is eight hours a day, five days a week. So it's full time, um, which is a really intense learning experience. I sort of turn them all loose at the end of that three months for a week. And I'm like, I don't want to see you and don't look at code for a week. Um, and so, and that's a lot and we break the day up. So like in the morning, we'll usually do lecture and we'll do that in chunks. Um, if I'm teaching in a three hour chunk of lecture, it's always like I talk for five minutes and then we do a thing for 15 minutes. Like it's mm-hmm. very hands on, very applied, like, as the more that I teach, the There's more movement. it's like, yes, 
Yeah. yeah, the less me talking is possible. Um, because program, you don't learn programming from somebody telling you this is how this works, this is how that works. You learn it from your hands on the keyboard. Yeah. Um, so I would say any learning that maximizes hands on the keyboard is is the good structure for learning. Um, when you have somebody to teach you in a classroom and they can kind of respond to your needs and they can kind of structure the class as, as you can you can make the big chunks of learning work. Because um, I kind of know, okay, people have the most energy this time of day, and then they can get through about this much before I lose them. And then in the afternoon, we've got to do this to kind of like mm. reamp the energy up. Mm -hmm. um, if you're self-managing, I would say start small in chunks or you'll bring yourself out. You know, if you're self-teaching, like I maybe spent two, three hours a night for a month when I first dug into this stuff and then was kind of like, and, and backed off a little bit for a while. Yeah. Um, and it depended. Sometimes on the weekend, I could just code for nine hours and lose time. So, um, but it's, when you're trying to actually ingest new material, I like to like maybe spend an hour learning a new thing and then spend a bunch more hours just reinforcing that thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd add to that too. I mean, you know, I think with any problem one tries to solve to make sure you don't get tunnel vision and mm -hmm. kind of step back. Like if, you, if you're if you spinning your wheels, then walk away. You know, go yeah, just, go go rewind, go reset, and, and then come back to it. Usually the solution is much clearer. The best debugger I know is a walk around the block. Mm. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Except if it's snowing, then you're <laughs> then the best debugger just becomes a sloshy mess. Yeah, right. <laughs> Not that Detroit knows anything about that. Oh no, it wasn't snowing here two weeks ago or anything. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we had the same garbage. Um, so so then. Obviously, different people learn in different ways. Would you say that there are some tactic, tactics that universally work better for ladies than do for men? Mm, not that I've noticed at all. No? No. No. What about, what about age? Do you think uh, huh. <laughs> there's some generational things that, you know, yeah, are I'm different? Really Really, age-wise, um, little kids need more, a lot more why up front and a lot more. They need to move faster. Um, so when I teach little ones, it's just like, how do we get a thing up and running really quickly that you can go, oh, cool, I did, they need that, that feedback loop to be very quick. Sure. Um, and they also don't last very long. You know, about an hour learning with Scratch is about the longest that I'll last with, with elementary school yeah. age kids. Yeah. Um, adults. A lot of the time, adults haven't been in a classroom environment in a long time um, by the time that they come in and are in our program. And so um, it's kind of coaching people back into that learning mentality and going, okay, like this is, you know, this is, this is going to be tiring in a whole different way than the job you know how to do is. Um, but yeah, generally I would say like adults, more attention span, um, more context to draw from. So metaphors are a lot easier. Mm -hmm. um, and also just have used more software. Well, at this point, I don't know. Kids use a lot of software, but. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, certainly kids have a, like, I always draw this correlation for my kids. Like, mm -hmm. we have Macs at home. They use Chromebooks at part of the school, but in the labs, it's Windows machines. I don't know that my kids could actually, I don't know that they, one, they don't know a world that's any different than having all three of these. There's no, like, oh, it's only Windows or it's only Apple. Like, they could completely could care less. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think it's instinct to them now. They just know they just switch back and forth like it's nothing. You know, yeah. in fact, the biggest the biggest thing I heard out of them was like, well, why are we learning this Excel thing? Like we have it in Google Apps. Like, I don't understand why I need to go do this other thing. Right. It's like, well, somebody's kind of still stuck on <laughs> on like business goo. And so they feel like you need to learn the office stack. Like and it, but my kids are 12 and 10. Like I just. They don't really care. It is interesting with kids, um, I noticed, that they intuit technology a lot faster and more easily. Like, I never with kids have to say, okay, now go to this menu, click on that. They just find it. Like, they know right away where to look for it, how to get to it. Like, they don't need me for any of that stuff at all. So in some ways, teaching kids is easier because it's less of the step-by-step. -step. Here's how you press this button. Like, you just don't have to do it. Um, I have an answer for that, I think. And I think it's baggage. Yeah. I mean, I don't, and I, I don't mean that in such a negative term, but like if I, if I think of my in-laws and how mm -hmm. they've come up, they came up through a very structured environment where a computer only did work a certain way and mm -hmm. bad things happened and like, you know, like systems went down. Right. So they're afraid. Whereas kids are just like, well, whatever, we'll just reboot it. Like they just, they're like, whatever, just touch it and we'll do it. There's no, there's no history of like any of that. They just don't. Yeah. Care. There's no anxiety. That's a really interesting point. Yeah. 
So I, I constantly uh, I find myself telling, like, it's okay to search. Just just touch around. It's cool. Mm-hmm. Like, you're not going to break it. Well, what if it gets a virus? Like, stop with the what ifs. We can just reset it. <laughs> like, it was backed up 10 minutes ago. We could just reapply that update. And mm-hmm. Cheer you. So. Right. Right. So uh, how, what about learning in different places? So if you're a... Um, I've been a big, I've always been a big fan of like, if you, if you're a .NET person, like go learn JavaScript or Mm -hmm. go learn C, uh, or go learn functional programming. Like if you're an object oriented programmer, go learn functional programming. That's a better corollary. Um, because you'll see how things kind of work over here. And while it doesn't necessarily, maybe it doesn't apply to the day job today because you guys aren't learning it. Maybe you'll become a better developer because you saw something in a completely different stack and. You know, one of the things I always tell people that go to that conference, like, do not go to the stuff that you know. Like, that's mm-hmm. if, right. If, if, like, you already know that. Like, you yep. go refine that at home. Go get exposure to, to this other stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, I think conferences are are the place to go and stretch your brain and expand. And, and I always try to go to the talks that I'm like, I have no idea what it's about, but I'm sure I'm gonna learn something interesting, right? Like, I'm gonna be able to take it home to work with me, but. The way that it stretches me and the way that it makes me think is a thing that I can take home to work with me, and that's really valuable. So that's, I mean, that's, I'm such a proponent of conferences for, in part, that reason, um, sure. that ability to expose yourself to different stuff. With all the stuff going around these days about mindfulness and kind of training one's mind and memory, and um, have you tried to apply any of those practices into your daily routine? Um, I'm actually a Buddhist, so yes. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. So I have a meditation practice. Um, I notice a great deal when I don't do it. Um, really? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my focus is better. My happiness is better. I don't get impatient or snappy with people. Um, if I have a day where I'm like edgy or stressed, I'll look at my calendar and go, "Oh, didn't meditate for the last three days." Okay. Um, so yeah, that's that's a big part of and and a lot of the work I do is so human centered and so focused and takes so much like direct one on one attention. Um, being able to maintain that kind of attention for me requires a mindfulness practice. Wow, so intrigued right now. Uh, <laughs> so it's 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 something that I've been I'm trying to get a handle on. I have not had my moment yet of I, I, I've done, but I am not there. So. Mm-hmm. How often, like, what does meditation look like for you then? Sure. So for me, um, it looks like usually two 15-minute chunks a day, one in the morning and one at night. Right. Um, it is just, I do mostly breath-focused. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do. You know, there are apps. Um, I actually really recommend an app called Calm. Um, Sorry, I'm using Headspace, but it was a 50 50. Headspace is great too. Yeah. 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 I have a lot of coworkers um, who are kind of working to establish meditation practices, and a lot of them are using one of those too. Yeah. Um, I think they're both fantastic, and they're both really good kind of foundational apps to get you started. Um, you do not want to just sit down on a cushion with no direction and sort of try to like clear your mind for 20 minutes. It's, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, I, you know, so I say start with five. Like if you can get through five minutes alone in your head, most of us can't even do that. Um, yeah. You know, it, it just, it's, and then also, um, I think in some ways developers are kind of uniquely equipped to be good at meditation because everybody is kind of bad at meditation and everybody is kind of bad at programming. Um, like we're always failing all of the time, right? And so we're yeah. used to that. <laughs> and yeah. so it's, you know, but the practice makes you better. And in and, and meditation, it's the same thing. You know, when you were sitting there and your brain wanders off and you kind of, okay, like we're thinking like back into, back into the zone. Um, you're already used to doing that, to self-correcting and to, to mm-hmm. trying to improve on a daily basis. So, yeah. How, how do you know when you are doing it well? As, um, as a student, you know, I, I, <laughs> my journey started in January, right? I, I, I've dabbled and now I've committed, and although the last few weeks have been pretty bad at it. But how do you know when you're doing well? For me, I know that I'm doing well when my time feels stretched out. Like my time... days time meditating or the the entire day like the entire day like my days feel longer and like they have more space and like i can intentionally place things in them and i don't feel like i'm running around chasing a soccer ball all the time i just i notice a qualitative difference in the way i experience time which sounds really weird now that i say it out Mm -hmm. loud Um, Mm -hmm. but that is how i know that that you know a i've been practicing and i've been practicing well 
do you, are you present at the time that you're doing like is that is that an active thing that yes. you know during the day or is it reflection back on the day no it's 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 something you experience in the moment you know for sure. me it's just like oh this is this is it i'm so here right now you know and i'm not my brain's not in 15 other places and i'm just focused on this one-on-one -on -one or this lesson or this piece of yeah yeah there was an exercise in the in the headspace about uh uh, trying to just take note of when you get up and you stand up and sit down. And I usually stand up, work standing up. I, I have not been able to do it. I, I cannot, I, I just cannot make that marker. Like it's happened once maybe. And I'm like, oh, I did it. Like, I was like, okay. So then I go over to my wife, Carrie, and I'm like, Carrie, just, just try this. Can you count how many times like you've, you've got, gotten up out of your chair and, and sat back down? She's like, oh, yeah, I got it. Next day, I was like, how many times? She goes, oh, my God, I didn't do it. <laughs> I'm like, okay, do it tomorrow. She's like, okay, yeah. Oh, I didn't do it again. <laughs> yeah. I find I mean, it's so I'm, hard. I'm years into practice and, and still, you know, I would say 95% of what I do is is unaware and unintentional, you know. Sure. But but the chunk that is, it's it's a huge difference for me. Um, I can, you know, I now I notice things like, if my brain is kind of spiraling off somewhere negative, like somebody has had an interaction with me and I'm like, oh man, they were so frustrated. They do this. I catch myself much faster. Like before mm. I'm like in a bad place with that person in my head, it's like, okay, we had one bad interaction. We're going to move on from that and not get, not get into the feelings about it. Yeah. Um, so that's the thing that I noticed. Like I can't do that if I don't meditate. I just, that's not a fundamental part of who I am. Mm. So that's good. Well, it's, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm learning. I believe it's important. And yeah. Um, I by far am a student in this uh, in this this new world for me. It's I uh, massive respect for everything that I've ever heard about or read about, and people who are just I I, yeah. I don't even know. Yeah. I think we're all students, right? Like I don't, you know, everybody I know who has a mindfulness practice is you know constantly frustrated by it and failing in some way. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, at the, I could probably go on all day about this. You sure. might have to have a whole nother one of these things. Uh, <laughs> all right, at the end of every one of these, I like to extend a bit of gratitude and acknowledge the other person. And I would, I am, am, am honored to just uh, say thank you and acknowledge you for the time that you have spent in the community, the time that you've spoken at that conference, the the charge that you've led on the, uh, in in all of the girls centered activities to be more in tech or mentoring or whatever like all of that being said you know thank you for the stuff that you do day in and day out it's it's appreciated even if it's not always said and and thank you for sharing today because i think uh our own learning after in this 20 years so i feel like an old curmudgeon dude but you know it hasn't been until the last few years where i realized that this it's not just the mechanics of learning, but there's so much more to that. And, um, and so thank you for the, for everything. Well, thank you. That conference was one of my favorites in 2016, and I'm so excited to come back this year. It's going to be even better because it's two years more practice. <laughs> um, the last question I have for you, and it's one that I ask everybody. Um, how would you define community? And what does it mean to you? I think that we're all on paths, and they might be paths of learning or paths of mindfulness or paths of growth or paths of practice or all of the above. And I think to me, community is having other people walking their paths with you. Maybe not the same paths, but somebody else who's on the same kind of journey and you can support each other in the journey. Love it. I love that. I, yeah. I I ask this question every day, and every day I get a different answer. And Good. I, 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 but I didn't think it was going to be that way. I didn't think I didn't. I mean, I knew it was going to be a little bit that way. I didn't think it would be as fast, vastly different as it is. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun as this continues on. If I can, I keep uncovering. But I love the yeah, past. Yeah, go listen to all of them now. <laughs> yeah, you just wait. I got some surprises coming. Uh all right. Well, with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for spending the time and listening to us uh, riff back and forth uh, for the past 30 minutes. It's been fantastic. I uh, would love to for you. Bleh, 
I would love for you to spend a little time and share what learning tactic, tactics, strategies do you employ? Um, share with everybody else. Maybe there's something there we didn't cover, which I'm sure that there is. So, um, so share with everybody else. What's worked for you? Where do you go? Is there a site? Is there a thing? Do you, do you How do you get in the flow, the zone, whatever? Uh, drop a link below. Um, Erica, where do people find you? Uh, people find me on Twitter at Erica Langerand, and that is L-A-N-G-U-I-R-A-N-D, and Erica with a K, so I couldn't have made that more complicated. <laughs> uh, and then you can find Detroit Labs at DetroitLabs.com. Awesome. Well, everybody, thank you for watching. Give us a thumbs up. Leave us a comment. We'll put Erica's information below. We'll see you next time.